<laughs> We're back. We're live. It's the one o'clock rock here on Monday. Our favorite science show, Research in Manoa. And we, you know, we introduce you to the research guys. In case you're wondering what's going on up there, it's Eric Pilger. And he is a systems engineer at HIGP. And uh, HIGP is the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. And that is going to be on the final. Okay? Write it down. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Eric. Thank you. <laughs> so we, we styled this uh, electronic instrumentation is for everyone or um, uh, uh, hot, um, there's a hot time uh, on the planet tonight. Uh, and finding today. the hot spaces everywhere and whatnot. Yep. So you're into hot, H-O-T, not the opera theater, but the, right. but the temperature. Right, I have the opera theater, but that's just <laughs> on a volunteer basis. This place, my... Uh, Pays my bills. So you have a you have a system of satellites with uh, mostly infrared cameras that travel all over the world, all around the world. Right. Um, and they and they take pictures, and you find out what's hot where. Right. There've been a number of satellites up there. Uh, Landsat is one that people may even have heard of because it's been taking pictures forever. Um, but as they learned more about what they wanted to do, they came up with this idea for two satellites they called Aqua and Terra and an instrument they called MODIS that would be dedicated to infrared observations. Because they discover there's a lot of things you can see in the infrared that reveal stuff about our planet. Now some of it's dedicated to vegetation and chlorophyll and all those sorts of uh, things that I'm not that interested in. But one of the goals for this miss mission that uh, the PIs where I work put in for funding for was to identify things that are really hot on the surface of the Earth. And by really hot, I'm talking about maybe 1,000 degrees or 2,000 degrees. Um, centigrade. Yeah, at that point, it almost doesn't matter. But <laughs> <laughs> Celsius, I actually think in Kelvin because I'm a physicist by training. But, okay. um, but yes, let's call it about uh, 1,200 degrees Celsius. Um, we're talking about things that are the temperature of the lava, the lava lake up at Kilauea, mm -hmm. um, surface flows, uh, hot burning fires. Far, uh, forest fires. Yes, forest fires, grass fires. I think it burns either hot enough or in a large enough area. Um, as we've discovered with the system, there are a number of other things that we can check out too. It turns out things don't need to be very large if they're really hot. So um, gas flares from oil wells turn out to be extremely hot. So even that's, though they're that's not hotter too than large. Uh, yeah, I'm guessing so it's a couple thousand degrees. Mm, um, okay. Uh, the slag from smelters, you know, they melt this stuff at thousands of degrees. Copper. They take out either the copper or the steel, and what's left over is junk to them. But they have to let it cool off, so they, they just dump it in a big pile on the ground. It takes a while to cool. And, uh, yeah, and then we can see it. Um, so, uh, but you, you're looking for large areas or, and or small areas that are hotter. Than right, the, the, than hotter, the smaller, hot. larger, not so hot. There's a limit. I think probably we can't bo go below about 600 degrees Celsius. Doesn't pick um, it up. Yeah, it just starts to merge with the background. Because um, you're flying way high. How high are you flying? Uh, I'd say, I think it's about 1,000 kilometers. It's not quite near Earth orbit, which all these small satellites are aiming for. That's about 500. Um, this is way over the atmosphere. This yes, though space. part of the reason I think it's above the 500 is that if you're at 500, there's still enough atmosphere that you slowly decay in your orbit. Mm. So the things that they want to last, and these satellites have been up a good 16 years, uh, they need them to be high enough that um, they don't slowly come down. Yeah, but let me put it in perspective. You know, you're using infrared cameras. I, it doesn't come down for R&R, &R, right? Nobody goes yeah, up to it and says, hi, we need to <laughs> you know, fix you or something. So it's been up there by itself, 16 years, taking pictures. Of course, the, you know, the interpretation has changed. And yeah. maybe, maybe the scientific uh, you know, appreciation of it has changed. But the fact is that what's up there has been up there for 16 years. Now, putting it in perspective, when I got a digital camera 16 years ago, <laughs> I think it had maybe one megapixel, yeah. maybe a well, lot. Is, you know? uh, now they come 20, 30 megapixels, uh, you know. So, or for instance, by. they don't have a camera the way we think of it up there. Mm. They have this line detector, and it scans along like this. So there's just a row of detectors, and they just... So they get an image that's um, this wide and, you know, the height of the Earth. 
Um, <laughs> okay. And they just keep sending them down periodically when they hit ground stations. Um, so our data tends oh, to come in. Oh, you mean when they pass over bursts. a ground station? Right. They pass over an antenna, and then they can send down what they have. They just do, do a dump on the yep. ground station. Mm -hmm. And then the, uh, the activity starts, because then that flows to a national data center that does all the data reduction. And you mentioned how what they do with it over the years has changed, and that's true. In the beginning, they started with just a few things. And they actually, <clears throat> they actually limited us to five math operations. Um, but nowadays, they have us and 20 or 30 other things that they do with each of these images that come down. OK, um, so, um, so when it comes down, it's not in the form of an image, or is it? You were telling me before yeah. it comes out in a, in a text report about oh, what the device is It comes is down as an image, yeah. and the data center takes it and does math with it, and then they create reports that they send out. So we get a text report that's just a list of uh, spots they think are hot, and it simply says latitude, longitude, this is how hot we thought it was, and by the way, here's all of the data from those channels. There's about five, uh, so, four infrared and one visible channel. As I recall, a, a degree in longitude or latitude is 60 miles, so you minutes must be mile, well yeah. within minutes rather than degrees. Huh? Oh, yes. Uh, so 300 meters. Yes. Um, that's much. That's minutes. Minutes or even seconds. 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 Yep. Now, we, we're talking about the measurement of what? Of the, the Earth's surface. Right. Which is measured in degrees of longitude and latitude. Right. But within those degrees, you have like a clock. You have 60 minutes, minutes degree, 60, 60 minutes in a, minute. a given degree, <laughs> and then 60 seconds in a given minute. Right. Uh, so a second would be a really small, relatively speaking, right? So small if unit. Uh, you know, I think it's that a minute is uh, a nautical mile, so that's six thousand feet. Uh, so a second is a hundred feet. Then that's so you can so you can get a report every every yeah. second. Yeah, a couple of seconds on the ground, yeah. three hundred. So yeah. and that would cover hundred feet. Probably uh, more like three hundred feet, hundred meters. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, or even yeah. bigger. So um, as we pass over, and this, it's actually a bit of an irony. If we had smaller pixels, then the signal would be so strong it would overwhelm the instrument. And you'd have to make a different instrument. Mm. But when... Well, you would make a different instrument if you could do the whole thing all, all if, over today. If you could, right. Yeah. But you'd think, oh, that's too bad. But, you know, when you get lemons, make lemonade. It turns out <laughs> that if we've got a pixel this size yeah. and then this little spot that's really hot, these ratios that we calculate reveal that that pixel has something unusual going on in it. And we can get a pretty good idea of how much of that unusual, as long as everything else is just sort of normal, but that, that middle yeah. thing is really well, hot. Well, could it be an aberration? Could it be that it's not accurate? Yes, and we have to watch out for that. One of their biggest concerns are uh, reflection off the ocean of the sun. So we mm -hmm. actually measure the angle that the sun might be making so that if it, if it looks like we're seeing the sun bouncing off the ocean, then we just we throw that pixel out because there's a pretty so, good chance. So that's, that uh, that's the old subtraction trick. You, you, um, you take the infrared picture, you take the regular photography, and then you subtract one from the other, and you get the, the heat. Or yeah, something like that. that yeah. I, I know that's not There's exactly that right. There's that plus a bit of a ratio, because it turns out that um, you can... It turns out that the things we're looking at, either regular ground temperature or these really hot things, give about the same measurement in one infrared channel, but they give markedly different measurements in the other one. So therefore, when you ratio the two, um, it, if you will, once again, uh, putting something to advantage. One of the channels doesn't really measure the temperature very well, and the other one does. Mm -hmm. And so we can see this exit temperature. So one helps you understand the other one. Yeah. Better. So, it, uh, but is it possible that you would get one pixel, one of that 300 feet, um, that's really hot, and then the next pixel, the next 300 feet, then it wouldn't be hot? Oh, certainly. So if you go over Kilauea, that crater is no more than a few hundred feet across. So there's one really, that lava lake up there, bang, it just jumps right out at us. Um, and then the rest of the pixels don't. 
So uh, we get a constant stream of those, although obviously when we first started we didn't because there was nothing there. And I can actually look back in time and see how it slowly picked up both in number of pixels and the intensity of them. Yeah. Here's a graphic. Let's see. What is oh, yeah. this so now? Here we are. You brought um, a little graphic, so let's... You know, we have two graphics of the, um, um, uh, the Kilauea area. And what you're seeing there is the smaller uh, locus of points is uh, Halimamau, the actual mm -hmm. um, crater. And it's broad because there's certain accuracies and, and location and the fact that we look from different angles and the pixels get elongated and drawn out. And, but you can see it centers the red spot uh, right there on the crater. The those bit little, off to the those right, little yellow square, or rather green squares yeah, there? Yeah, those green squares that's are the hot spot. Yeah, that's, that's how big picture. they are. Yep. Okay. And then um, off to the right there, I think our viewers may well recognize the attack on Pahoa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that is, this is from um, over a year ago. So this is sort of halfway through 2014 to through 2015. And um, the flow was heading out toward Pahoa. Um, I don't know if we have the other graphic. We'll, we'll take uh, oh, there we are. And now this is from mid-2015 oh, to it's today. it's changed, yeah. It's changed. You can see it stopped attacking Pahoa, but now we've got it going down to the ocean again. So... Um, now this is all from a satellite of yeah. 600 miles above the Earth. Yeah. Pretty good. And the mar uh, miracles of modern technology, we've got Google Earth you know, throwing it on Google Earth <laughs> on the left there. And um, actually, they're both Google Earth images. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, but you're interposing the pixels on... Yes. ...the one on the right. On top of the data. Yeah. And then using clustering on the left, just to give you an idea, when you're looking at the site of where things might be interesting. So uh, when, it's, when it's green, is that denote a particularly high temperature? I mean, is, is this color coded this for point, temperature? No, this one is coded for just how many there are. Mm. So that's why it's red right at the center there. That's where there's a concentration of pixels. Mm -hmm. And you notice in the one on the right, there's some red areas. That's, I'm guessing that's where um, Pu'o'o is. Mm -hmm. So where you get the most of it. Yeah. And then of course it's headed off uh, to the east. Mm -hmm. um, down the mountain. Once it stopped uh, attacking Pahoa, it spent a lot of time just sort of oozing out and spreading out up there, and that's that bit that's to the north and the east. And then suddenly it turned around and headed back toward the ocean. And I would say the majority of that, that part heading toward the ocean is just from the last you know, couple of weeks. So how often does the satellite get around to taking a picture like this? It orbits the globe about 16 times a day. So um, we have to wait about a day to get complete coverage, but then we'll get complete coverage only at a certain time in the night from any one satellite. So for instance, on one day you might get all the nighttime coverage, and then another you get all the daytime coverage. Um, but you come back during what, both day and night. Right, so we have two satellites, and they're staggered. They're actually um, two hours before midnight and noon, and two hours after midnight and noon. So we get four of these uh, time periods and they're intermixed, so we actually get a revisit time on a particular spot in the globe maybe twice per day, once a night and once a day. And like, like us, we're, we're going to revisit this subject after a short break. Sometimes you have to revisit. <laughs> you have to revisit here on Think Tech. We'll be right back. Hi, my name is Kim Lau, and I'm the host of Hawaii Rising. You can watch me every other Monday at 4 p.m., Aloha, Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii. I appear every other Monday at 3 in the afternoon. Do not tune in in the morning. My topic is energy efficiency. It sounds dry as heck, but it's not. We're paying $5 billion a year for imported oil. My job is to shave that, shave that, shave that down in homes and buildings while delivering better comfort, better light, better air conditioning, better everything. So if you're interested in your future, you'd better tune in to me. Three o'clock every other 
Monday Code Green Aloha and thank you very much. Okay, we're back. We're live with Eric Pilcher. He's a systems engineer at HIGP. That's the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. From now on, I'm using only the acronym, yeah? HIGP, thank you. <laughs> Which is part of SOWEST, the School of Ocean and Earth Science. And we concentrate on this in Research of Manoa every single Monday at 1, 1, 1 p.m. So we have more pictures. Let's talk about pictures outside Hawaii, outside right. the U.S. What do we got? Okay, so here we have something that's timely. Uh, it's not clear as you can see from the map on the left. This is Brazil, and the area to the, uh, the top, the north, is the Amazon Basin. And you can actually see a bit of the river flow there. Mm -hmm. Now you can see how the fires follow uh, the main river and the tributaries as people encroach into uh, the rainforest, cutting and burning. Now most of those hot pixels unlike the ones over our, uh, our volcanoes, are all slash and burn agriculture. Um, here in Brazil and in Africa, you will see a lot of um, seasonal fires. They uh, go in, they burn out the leftover stuff, and then they plant. Intentional. It's, it's right. agricultural. It's a way to clear. Yeah. Um, and it, certainly within the Amazon, they cut down and clear forests by burning. You know, I mean, in Hawaii, when I came to Hawaii, it was a regular business on the plantations to burn. And uh, then, you know, a year or two ago, we heard a lot of fuss about it on Maui, and people saying, bad idea, can't do that. Um, but really, I mean, from your point of view, A, is it a bad thing for the environment? And B, uh, can your technology help us find out where, where they're doing this? So one of the original drivers for this was to study uh, the amount of carbon that was being released in the atmosphere. Um, the original funding came from NASA, and NASA supported this effort all along. And uh, the original uh, grant was to look at how well we could study um, burning and how much it might contribute. Because we found that mm. the energy that's released, either from fires or from lava or from um, these man-made industrial events is tied directly to how much you're burning and how much you're releasing. And in carbon um, into the atmosphere. So in the case of trees or grass, yes, yeah, it's, it's actually, there's going to be a, a linear relationship between the amount of energy that's released, which we can measure from this. Not only do we get the pixels and know the number of them, but we know their intensity as well. And we can relate that fairly directly to the amount of energy that's been released, and that's directly relatable to the amount of materials that you burn. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know if you've done this, but it strikes me that there's a dynamic here. So you could say uh, from, say, January 1st to 2016 to January 1st, 2017, uh, we are burning more. We are having more hot spots, more burning, and therefore more carbon into the right. atmosphere. Right. You could certainly do that with this system. And nobody has yet, um, partly because uh, the funding that we've received over the years is predominantly geared toward volcanology. And, yeah. But um, the system itself has been adopted by a number of people to get more information. And it's interesting, an interesting synergy here that the volcanologists were the first ones to think of the possibility of getting the energy output from burning, partly because they had done the basic physics with volcanoes and they knew that was probably um, could be carried over. Um, but how long is the, uh, these satellites going to stay in place? You know, because when they come down, somebody's yeah. going to say, oh, we got to do it again, but it's going to cost a lot more money because that's the way it works. And we have more sophisticated equipment, and that costs more money. And, and then, you know, there's going to be a struggle to get them back. So, right. How, so right now you're in seventh heaven. That's, that's actually a wonderful image. You're in seventh <laughs> heaven. Looking That's down a on a thousand kilometers. <laughs> Eighth heaven is at twelve hundred kilometers. Because it's up there and it's working, and you know, yep. and you're getting all the stream of information. But how long are you going to stay up there before you hit a crisis? Yeah, um, with these satellites, 
they don't have to correct their orbit very much. The geosynchronous satellite, the GOES weather satellites, they have lifetimes because they carry a certain amount of fuels to adjust their positioning. Even though they have geosynchronous orbits, they drift around and they keep having to correct. Mm -hmm. Whereas these just go and they don't really care. So wherever they are, they know where they are. Yeah. So as long as these keep functioning, they'll just keep going. I, they've been going for 15 they work years. On solar? They could probably go another 15, yes. Solar panels, obviously the solar panels are slowly wearing out from cosmic rays and things like that. Um, and there could be a catastrophic failure and then an instrument would stop working. Uh, uh, some kind of space, uh, what do you call it, a um, meteorite? Right, there could be a meteorite or even just the accumulated doses of radiation finally mm -hmm. fry something. And, yeah. Um, so you were talking before about, uh, you know, the proliferation of satellites in our right, around Earth. Right, especially small satellites. And that, I was going to comment on how um, People still are looking at new large satellites, but ever more they're looking at um, uh, replacing one large satellite with a huge number of small satellites. What, what's, now, the, what's the analysis on that? Why are smaller ones better? The main thing you get from smaller satellites is a lot more flexibility and coverage. So with these satellites, they follow a set course. There's only two of them, so there's only... Uh, you have to wait a certain amount of time to cover the entire Earth. If you could launch 500 small satellites, then they could completely, you know, their tracks would be one every minute. So you might literally be able to um, have on-demand pictures of the ground From whenever anywhere. you want them. Anywhere, yeah. yeah. Anyway. And that's uh, what a number of um, commercial interests are looking at mm -hmm. in the visible, but the scientists are interested in that sort of thing as well. So you're saying the next generation, to put it that way, right. of these smaller satellites is going to be in the, what, the thousands or tens of thousands? Yes. Uh, there's a crazy number proposed right now. There's not a lot of um, solutions being done as to, well, how are you going to get them all down again? Um, but that's something we're going to have to work on. Well, there's, there is no way to get them down, is there? Well, yes, blow them up because you still have pieces. Here's like what that. happens with the smaller satellites: you don't launch them as high. Now that gives you the advantage that you can see more of the ground at a, a finer resolution. Yeah. But it means they have limited lifetimes because there's a bit of atmosphere left at that so altitude. It will deteriorate. Yeah. And they'll deteriorate and then burn up when they re-enter. Yeah, that's um, that's a good solution. It gives you a, a burning sunset, as it were. <laughs> and um, there are a host of new technologies they're working on. Um, there's something that's uh, interestingly called a balut. It's like a balloon parachute. <laughs> in space, you can't just make a parachute because it won't stay up. But if you inflate it so it's like a balloon shaped yeah, in a parachute, sure. um, you suddenly have a dramatically increased air resistance. So like the space station, which has to be lofted back up every few days because it's constantly sinking due to its panels, uh, yeah. uh, you could... Um, deploy one of these things, and then all of a sudden your small satellite looks like a big satellite and it comes down way faster. Uh, you know, the thing is, though, you, you pump all these things up there and they're going to be up there for a while. And, you know, in, in air traffic, we have the FAA. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, the guys with the radar and they're watching all the blips on the screens. I mean, how do we track all these thousands or tens of thousands? Right. You, know, well, you, you don't want takes care one to hit us, the right? other and all that, yeah. right? There's actually a whole uh, wing of um, the military that's responsible for tracking everything down to the size of a tennis ball, I think. Is that right? Um, and whenever you launch a satellite, the first thing you wait for them for is for them to pick it up and say, well, here's your, here's your orbital elements. This is, this is you. So they're gonna, you don't have to tell them. They know. Oh, they know. They're, yes, they're watching. They, know. they actually have uh, you know, these radars. Um, but... Uh, the large numbers may overwhelm even that. that their systems, yeah. the trouble with most of the things in the existing space industry is they, they take a while to change. Um, and in, so, in life in general. I, think, <laughs> you know, know, I guess it's true. You talk about high technology still takes a while to right. change. And the thing about this uh, small satellite revolution is it's kind of catching people off guard because it, it's going off at a completely different track. And by leaps and bounds... And the existing infrastructure is going, uh, whoa, wait, 
<laughs> What's happening? Um, yeah, it's going to be an interesting, yeah. interesting time. And, well, you'll, you'll be a beneficiary, won't you? You'll have yes. uh, pictures closer and uh, at higher resolution. You have more data, and uh, you, can, you can draw maps along the lines I was talking about. Which which measure the the different the dynamic difference between one month the next month yes. one year the next year yeah and you can start monitoring uh, all sorts of agricultural things um, it's going to be really important for climate change because we're going to see that what we were used to is not happening anymore and um, we need to be able to identify right. it things are changing you know yeah. is this field drying out more than normal or? yeah. Yeah. Well, let's, let's, take here, a, yeah let's take a look at that last uh, photo. What's this now? So, um, I don't know if I mentioned already, but uh, you can see industrial activity, and this is perhaps an area that's near and dear to our hearts. Um, it's where all our oil comes from. Um, this is actually um, Iraq and Kuwait, and that string, of, that sort of arc of spots are oil wells. You can see they've obviously got some sort of a... Um, a deposit that has large and geographical extent and they just mm -hmm. drill holes down to it and pull the oil out. And in most of the oil industry, um, almost any time you pull oil out of the ground, there's going to be other things mixed in, like methane gas. And that's um, hot. And they typically, well, they typically burn it. And so there are actual oil flares. And if you zoom in on Google Earth to these areas, sometimes you can see those flares just... Um, I mean, uh, you would, me, me I can do it. On, yeah, on if you computer. go to Google Earth and or Google, you know, see the flares maps, with, the, with the wells. If you were to zoom in closer to these areas, you don't see it so much here because my green spots are covering it over. Yeah. Uh, the one at the very top, you can see there's a little black next to it. Yeah. That's also what you usually see. Is it just there's just scorched earth around the, uh, you know, around so, the flared area. Well, this suggests that you could you could identify oil activity wherever it's happening. Right, and, and, and for that for that matter, the intensity of it. Yes, yes. Um, as a matter of fact, partway through our observations, I saw that they'd clearly open up uh, an oil well off like Nova Scotia, because all of a sudden a flare appeared in the middle of the ocean, and you're not. <laughs> uh -huh. um, you can't zoom in on Google Earth there as well because they don't tend to show us things in the ocean. They're they're trying to save space. So, so <clears throat> let me ask you my last question. We're just about out of time. Why do I care what you're doing? Well, I do believe that we can come up with some, um, okay, let's put it this way. When we started, there were a few limited uses, but over time, more and more uses are being discovered. And so uh, the stuff I'm doing might not benefit you directly, but there are a lot of ancillary things. Um, there is a lot of agricultural information now coming out. Um, both in terms of uh, what's in the soil, like moisture contents, um, how well the plants are doing. Um, one of the growing areas in use for Landsat data is apparently uh, farmers. And ironically, I've been told, it's farmers in other countries like Europe and Australia using the imagery to know that um, they need to fertilize a little bit more over in this field or they need to water a bit more because this these plants are looking stressed, or we're seeing uh, some sort of an infestation coming in because you can kind of see it progressing. And that's important too, the, the timeliness, because that tells you, oh, it's, I don't need to worry too much about it, or I really need to start worrying about this because it's moving fast. Um, and I think that um, we'll come up with more enhanced sorts of solutions in the future, even if it's stuff we deploy to UAVs, and there's that bit of a feedback. Once you learn the kinds of things you can look for, and as the instruments are made smaller and smaller, they could put them in UAVs, for instance, and they could be the ones that are supposed to be flying over the forest fire, <laughs> actually flown by the firefighters, revealing hot spots, revealing perhaps <clears throat> places that might burn up more because you can get an idea of, say, that they're especially dry or something yeah. like that. Yeah. So the uh, sensors may come and go, may change, will change, but um, what, the real benefit here is the interpretation of the yes. data you get down from them. Yeah. Right. Eric Pilger, uh, systems engineer at HIGP, uh, doing electronic uh, instrumentation, and it is for everybody. 
and uh, uh, a hot time uh, on the old planet every day. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. Eric. <laughs>